You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Hey everyone, welcome back to Contractor Evolution. I'm here joined by Benji at the studio. Hey everyone, uh, we got a good one for you today. So your business is a for-profit entity. I think you know that. You started this thing to make money. There are, of course, other hugely important aspects to your deeper purpose as an entrepreneur. But if making money isn't near the top of the list, you're in the wrong game. Profits are a slippery business, though. Sometimes it can feel like what you made on paper um, versus what is in your bank account. Those, those two don't quite line up. Sometimes top line growth doesn't translate to bottom line growth. And sometimes it's only a few expense categories on our PNL that are giving us all the headache. So in today's episode, we're going to peel back the curtain and we're going to show you where and how contractors most commonly destroy their year end profits. So before we get into the three things, it's really important that you, the listener, understand how we track this and kind of where we where we draw these conclusions from. So at our parent company, Breakthrough Academy, we systemize contracting businesses for growth. We're working with over 450 entrepreneurs as we speak, our team of unbelievable industry specialized coaches. Uh, they work with our members to implement systems, create infrastructure, and make the businesses infinitely more scalable and fun to own. Now, one of the most important KPIs we track is net profit. What's the point of doing all of this work if it isn't impacting your bottom line, right? We can, we can talk about business systems and best practices until the cows come home, but if the business owner uh, himself or herself, uh, if, the, if the company that we're coaching isn't keeping more at the end of the year, then this is all hot air. Now, to do this effectively at scale, we created a proprietary tool called the Master Business Plan or MBP file for short. It's a super robust financial tracker uh, and overall performance dashboard. Now, for the individual business owner, it's literally like turning a light on in a dark room. They're able to see their path forward with a stunning clarity that they never had before. Uh, from there, they can set realistic goals and then reverse engineer their path towards them. Getting one in place is usually one of the first big wins that we have with a new Breakthrough Academy member. The other thing that this tool does for us is it allows us to be pretty surgical with our coaching. Our approach to system implementation isn't willy-nilly. It's not done off of feelings. Our approach to coaching each business we work with is tailored based on the data that the MBP file provides us. Different businesses obviously need different things, and the data doesn't lie about that, which I think is pretty cool. Now, if this level of attention and care sounds like something you need to do with your business, you can book a business assessment with us using the link in the description. You can learn about the program and you can find out if this level of financial analysis would be beneficial for you and your business. So to check that out, to book a meeting with us uh, and go deep on some numbers, click the link in the description. Anyway, my point in breaking all of this down, kind of explaining how we track this stuff, is that we, as we're recording this, have nearly 500 MVP files that we can and do look at in live time. This gives us a pretty unique, broad perspective on trends and patterns, and it's from this broad perspective that I wanna share with you, or we wanna share with you, the three most consistent profit killers. Um, we worked really closely with the coaches on these, and I just wanna give a really quick shout out to Coach Paul Atherton, uh, Coach Dan Dasko, and Coach Ian Overkirk for their contributions. Thanks, guys. Now. Three things, these three things probably aren't going to shock you. I doubt you'll hear these and go, wow, I never would have guessed that. Your reaction is going to be more like, huh, I thought so. Your suspicions will likely be confirmed. Might be some new information in there as well, but being validated, feeling validated, sometimes that's a really nice feeling. The other thing we're going to pack in here are some pieces of practical advice to avoid or correct some of these all too common profit killers. So let's dive in to the three biggest profit killers. Igor, kick us off with number one. 
Awesome. So here's the first thing we want to talk about is overhead efficiency, okay? Or having overhead structure that is too high, an aggregate overhead number that is too high for the amount of revenue that's being produced and the amount of gross profit that's that that's coming out of that revenue. So I just want to start off with, with some definitions so it's super clear what we're talking about here, right? So by overhead efficiency, what we mean by that is we're looking at um, how much revenue and how much gross profit can be pushed through a set amount of overhead, right? So you've got a set amount of overhead staff right. in your team, um, equipment that's being paid for in a year, an office, office space, yeah. marketing, all that kind of stuff. So think of that as like one big box. And the question is, is how much revenue and how much gross profit are you able to push through that box in a given year? What Paul always says, which I love is he says, um, your overhead doesn't care how much revenue you do. Yeah. So it's, totally. like it's gonna be the same. Totally. You do a lot this month, you do a little, you have a big yeah. year, you have a small year, those bills still need to be paid paid. And so the goal for a very profit focused entrepreneur is like you say, cram revenue through that overhead. Exactly, exactly. So it, it's a super important metric both for understanding a company's growth potential, because companies that are that are a high, that are a strong prospect for lots of good long-term growth are ones that are able to move a lot of revenue through that overhead without having to increase it further, right? So it's a great metric for looking at your growth potential. And it's obviously a super important metric for pro for measuring profitability. Um, now, some quick definitions here, okay? I wanted to define the difference, uh, in case you don't know this, between variable costs and overhead costs, right? So two, two totally different expense categories, cost categories. Variable costs are directly related to a job, right? So if you are a landscape contractor, they're the materials and the direct labor costs that, that, specific, that you can specifically attribute to an individual job. Mm -hmm. Those are variable costs. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there's a kind of a generalized term cost of goods sold in there as well. Overhead is separate. Overhead costs are those that you cannot attribute to one specific job, right? So there might be like Facebook ads that are going out or you might have uh, an F350 or whatever. You can't assign, you can't peg the cost of that truck's fuel for the year to one individual job, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of what overhead is. And um, one of the common kind of question marks that we that I, f I find contractors often don't understand as much as they should is the differences with staff, mm -hmm. right? Because you've got, uh, the likelihood is you've got staff, some that are a variable cost and some staff- That's overhead. That, that's overhead, right? So your uh, landscape installer or the site foreman, uh, is different than, let's say, your... Uh, Project your manager, production manager, marketing coordinator. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. So the, I think a really simple division for people to think about this in a memorable way is if the employee spends the vast majority of, of their time on site moving a project forward towards completion, and then when it's done, it's on to the next thing, those people would be categorized as variable costs or cost of goods sold. If somebody spends more of their time in the office, in a vehicle, overseeing things they're not as connected to each individual project those people would be categorized as overhead and when we talk about overhead efficiency the real needle mover here is how well you can drive performance out of those overhead salaries 100%. not the people on site because it's pretty like you say it's pretty easy to see how yeah. much the you know your framer did today totally how much your landscaper did today it's more difficult to see the other roles. I'll give you another way to look at this whole thing, which is, I think, very simple, is do you estimate for this person's hours? That's a really good... Yeah, okay, good right, so you're, you're, you're doing a quote for a job, whether it's a small residential job or a huge commercial one. Are you estimating for that individual's time and directly charging that to the customer? If you are, that's a variable expense that's infill labor. And if you're not... Uh, like you don't estimate when you think about it, you do a quote, you're not, you're not estimating for the accountants hours. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, right. So mm -hmm. that, that's another way to look at this stuff. So when you look at your, at your budget or your profit and loss at the end of a year, you really have two very separate line items for labor at the top above the gross, the gross margin line and the cost of goods sold. Yeah. There is like an infield labor number. Right, and then, and below, then that. below that, in your overhead stack, you've got overhead salaries. So, but here's totally the question: different. Why? Why is managing the over? Why is getting the overhead salaries efficient? Why is managing their performance like? Why is that trickier? And you know, why is it on this list as a profit killer? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I think that that's the key. That's the key thing to understand here is is 
uh, we see this so clearly. Uh, managing performance in overhead staff is way more complex than it is in field labor. So if I've got a carpenter, okay, um, and we're framing, I can set goals with that person based on the way that that job is estimated and how many labor hours we're assigning to, in this example, framing a certain section of a new house. Mm -hmm. And I can... We set goals with those people at the beginning of a day or at the beginning of a week, and then I can come back at the end of that day or the end of that week and see proof of work. very visually mm-hmm. what is done and what isn't. And right. we can say the goal was by the end of the day was to complete X, Y, and Z on a crew of a few people. And at the end of the day, was that done or not? Right. Right. Uh, same thing with landscapers. If I've got a landscape technician, there's a certain amount of physical labor that needs to be done. I can come back at the end of the day and say, was this look at it and say, was this done or not? So it's, e- it's easy to measure. It's easy to quantify. In many cases, you, have, you can actually reach out and touch the work. Exactly. Whereas right? for and these other roles, it's, 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 it's all, it can oftentimes be a bit more intangible and way harder to manage. So this is an interesting concept. There is a famous book, uh, you know, of it, The Effective Executive yeah. by, by Peter Drucker. This is kind of like a Bible of management. Yeah. And I think Old it was, school. yeah, it was written like decades and decades ago, but it's the fundamentals are still just as relevant today. And I remember from that book, Peter Drucker talks in, in in one of the early chapters about this very concept. And he, and he, you know, he uses the example of like more extreme examples of like a ditch digger and a sales manager, right? right. In our terms, the ditch digger would be the infield labor and you can go, you sign, okay, you got to uh, excavate a ditch this big. Okay. You come back at the end of the day, is it done or not? And then he uses the example of, okay, so you're walking down the hall in your office and there's like, you know, Johnny, the sales manager, and his door's open and he's just, he's laying and laying back in his chair with his feet up on a table with a big cigar. Remember this book mm-hmm. is written decades ago. So just smoking mm-hmm. inside and he's just, just, just pipe pumping O's into the air. Right. And you're wondering, is he hard at work thinking about sales, the sales team as a sales manager, yeah. or is he literally doing nothing? Is he just you have smoking? no idea. Is he smoking a cigar or is he like deeply strategizing in totally. his mind? You don't know. You have no idea, right? right? So anyway, that's the funny example that, that Peter Drucker uses in the book, but the, the principle is very relevant here, which is I find that so many contractors have a much harder time holding accountability to productive results mm-hmm. with with some of these uh, these overhead roles, mm-hmm. right? So it's a lot more difficult to say, to look at like with your office manager or you're an account or your accountant and say, is this person hyper productive in their role or are they not, mm-hmm. right? And what that requires is a way more sophisticated level of strategic performance management and measuring results. Mm-hmm. Well, what you'll see with businesses, um, like when we look at these MBP files and this is being mismanaged or just not paid attention to, to the degree that it deserves, is you'll see these really big swollen overhead categories. You have all these people working for this person's $45,000 a year, this person's $70,000 a year, this person's a hundred. And all of a sudden like this huge, you've got this, all this, this fixed cost is just swollen. It's bogged down. Yes, you have, you have a team, but you're not actually getting the return in revenue and therefore the return in profit from those workers. That's usually what we see in these MVP files. So it's a measurability issue. It's a performance management issue. What, like, if if you met a business, if someone's listening to this, like, oh, my God, that's totally me. Like, what practical steps yeah. can be taken to start to fix this? Yeah, exactly. This is where we're coming back to why this is such a profit killer, right? Um, so the, the, the practical bit here is you really have to be able to justify the productivity and the ROI, the return on investment on every one of your overhead staff, right? And I understand this is not, like, a super easy thing to do for most contractors, but you have to be able to look at it as, like, you've got a certain amount of dollars going into this, what is the return on those dollars that's coming out of that individual? And there's sometimes that you have to apply a bit of creativity in how you manage this. But if I'm looking at like, um, what would, you know, an, uh, an example where this would be hard to quantify would be like, uh, some people have an assistant, right? Or you've got some sort of office admin yep. that's assisting you in certain things. Coordinator. Coordinator. Um, admin, dispatcher. Yeah, dispatcher, right? So you basically yeah. like, you have to be able to map like, if that person was not here, how much less would I be productive or would our production team be less productive without this individual, this coordinator, dispatcher, assistant, whatever, um, and say, okay, by the fact that they're here, how much more are we doing in revenue 
and in gross profit. And what does that mean in terms of a multiple that we're paying them? I'll give you another example. If you've got some sort of marketing coordinator or marketing manager, well, how much more in revenue and gross profit are you driving based on the fact that you're paying them a $80,000 a year salary plus all the burdens that go along with that salary? What is your ROI on the investment into that salary? And do we have the ability to track it? But my question would be like, so Igor, a lot of these sort of um, more overhead type roles. We rattled them off a second ago and the, the list is a lot longer. Um, some of the stuff that they're working on, some of these deliverables, um, they're a lot like we're dealing in abstraction here. It's mm-hmm. not as cut and dry. It's not as concrete. You can't reach out and touch it like you can with some of these job site roles. Mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts around how to like quantify that? What kind of math are you doing? What kind of numbers are you looking at? What kind of metrics are you hoping to see from them? For someone who's just approaching this for the first time and they're like, yeah, I get what he's saying, but I don't really know how to like, I don't really know yeah. how to do the math in the calculator. Like any pointers for someone who wanted to start to just add some real, perf- add some metrics to these more abstract roles. How I think about that is what if that person wasn't there? Right. That, that's typically in my head, me personally, if you're asking me, that's my number one go-to. If what they, would this look like if this individual wasn't here? You're kind of quantifying it in the negative. If this person was gone, how yeah. much worse off like would I, our business I, I be? Know, I know I'm paying a salary of, okay, let's just use some round numbers, $85,000 a year plus burdens. It's a $100,000 expense to the company, mm-hmm. okay? So we have to be significantly more than $100,000 of gross profit. Remember, it's not revenue. It's mm-hmm. gross profit because you got to, before you realize the gross profit, you got to pay a bunch of these, these variable costs to get there. Mm-hmm. So are we significantly more than 100,000 bucks better off in gross profit by the fact that this person's here. That'll be a much easier way to think about it because if, if you're dealing with some uh, marketing coordinator or, or uh, office manager, you can basically ask yourself like, you know, would we have that much more revenue? Are we having this much more revenue by the fact that this person's here? And if I took them away, hypothetically, if I fired them tomorrow, um, would we be in the hole right. that much or more? Yep. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the way that you'd look at a dispatcher, for instance, right? With like certain low average job size businesses where like, are we, if this person wasn't here tomorrow, would we have significantly less revenue because they weren't doing their job? So you can, that, when you look at it that way, you're typically able to quantify that. Now, let me just talk a bit about some practical management because this is, this is a really important bit here, right? Um, you have to have very clearly defined annual plans and objectives for them and that, that specifically bring cl- clear ROI to the company. So if you've got a dispatcher, how much dispatching work are they doing in a yeah. given year where that math in the calculator makes sense for that increased revenue based on their salary? If you've got uh, a marketer in mm-hmm. the office, what are they driving mm-hmm. in terms of additional leads that mm-hmm. are going to convert to estimates, that are going to convert to booked and produce jobs? To facilitate that, what are the projects and the initiatives that the office manager is 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 you know making a reality this year that are going to significantly increase the uh, the company's revenue over the coming years? So you need to be able to define very specific outcomes and deliverables for the year by each of these people. And then you need to manage that performance weekly towards those goals. And uh, we've covered this in a separate episode on GSNR goal setting and review Mm -hmm. meetings that happen once a week where you're basically recapping what they actually did compared to their goals last week Mm -hmm. and what their very specific goals for the upcoming week are that's going to drive a return for the company. And that probably needs to be done with a little more rigor than some of your job site type roles because b- just it's because conceptually of the nature, more difficult, just right? Like you can't walk up it, and be it, like, well, exactly. how much landscaping was done or how much framing or roofing was done. So it just, it, it, this is why I say, I want to come back to the point I started with is it's just, it's not like, by the way, to be clear, investing in good overhead, super duper important. We're not I'm just saying, saying don't do it. Yeah, you absolutely have to do it actually. It's just what, what I'm highlighting here is that the actual performance management and tracking of it is more complex and this is why so many even very smart contractors uh struggle with it and get really bloated and fat in the overhead department so that's profit killer number one okay watch your overhead efficiency profit killer number two is materials now materials of late are blowing budgets to smithereens um like this was once a fairly predictable line item uh, in other words, it was fairly stable from year to year, month to month. Um, now it is literally 
anything but. This has become a hugely difficult part uh, of a PL to manage. This is multifaceted. Part of it is inflationary. Um, uh, a lot of this like reckless spending over the last few years is catching up with us. So you're seeing prices increase on a whole uh, a whole array of different products. Um, the other part of it is, is the supply chain thing. So things are shipping at unbelievably slow rates. Lead times are ridiculously slow. It takes forever to get anything these days. Um, and it's and uh, I think for a lot of contractors are feeling this very real thing, which is like getting basic, basic materials to complete the job um, is more frustrating and more expensive than it's ever been. I'm not pointing fingers either, but I wouldn't rule out the possibility that, uh, like, I don't think it's impossible that some suppliers and distributors are also taking advantage of this to some extent. It's a dire situation. The demand pressure is just too big to ignore. Uh, the prices could be getting jacked up further. I'm, I'm not saying that's impossible. Um, this seems funny enough to be especially the case for subtrades. Like electricians and plumbers are getting raked over the coals on this the worst. I think because a lot of the stuff they need is very specialized. It's very niched. Um, now, I'll just use an example. In in our MB, one, one MBP file that we have, electrical client, um, their materials line item as a percentage of overall revenue has gone up 9% compared to last year. 9% in one as a percentage of overall as a percentage revenue. of overall yeah, revenue so you're not gone up 9% <laughs> no that's what yeah no it's like yeah. it could, like if you're doing that math it could be double but i'm saying as a percentage of overall revenue mm -hmm. uh, it's gone from something in the low 30s to nearly 40% yikes um and while sub trades are feeling this the worst, like as, as an individual, as a niche within the market, the entire sort of the entire construction and trades economy and the entire global economy um, is feeling this as a whole. So expenses, uh, sorry, materials are a huge, huge, huge area um, that people are feeling this on. Our practical steps to fixing this, okay, number one would be like shop your business around a little bit. Like, you know, it's probably time to revisit your pricing. It's probably um, time to have your suppliers sharpen their pencil a little bit. Pick up the phone, send out some email, uh, some emails, start to look at other options. You may find that the supplier, the distributor that you're working with primarily is still the best one. You may find that something else is better, but it would now would be a very, very good time to start to do some investigating on if and when and where you can get a better price on materials. Another thing that's been uh, a little bit, this is a bigger project, but inventory management systems. So something like Tracnicity, there's lots of others too. A piece of software that helps you manage your inventory. You might actually have a ton of materials that you can use that are lying around the shop. They're lying around your backyard. You just literally don't know where they are and you've forgotten about them. So there's underutilized things that you may actually have. Um, and if you had you uh, installed a good piece of software, a good piece of inventory tracking uh, technology, you may be able to utilize some of that stuff. Some of our members that have uh, that have a good system in place for that are feeling this to a much lesser degree. Here's, I think, the most important point for managing the materials expense. The terms and conditions within your contracts need to be edited and changed. There's clauses, there's terminology that need to be updated specifically around how long the quote or the estimate or the bid is good for. In this market right now, we're recording this in uh, end of May, 2022. Prices are good for like seven to 14 days right now, no longer. So if you've mm -hmm. put out, a t if you're getting a call back on a bid you did two months ago, and the general goes, we want to go forward with this. Or the homeowner goes, we want to go forward with this. And you're just like too busy to double check. You know, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. you, are, you are likely taking an absolute bath on that project and you don't even realize it. So you yeah. need to go back to your job cost cards. Do not be lazy about this. Um, you need to get better at passing rising costs along to the customer and watch this like a hawk. So that's, I think the most important thing and probably the lowest hanging fruit would be go back to your contract and update some of those things so that you're not left holding the bag uh, on a project that, that wants to go forward. But you know, the pricing that you built that estimate off of is like long gone. So yeah. that would be our that, practical. That one's tough, right? You, you, Benji, you and I have both been in these situations, right? Where like it's, it's, it's fun and easy and exciting to just accept new sales. Yeah, totally. Right? It's, like, it's exciting. Yeah. You want to yeah. go for it? Hell yeah. Let's do let's it. Let's go. 14,000 bucks. Let's go. Let's do it. Right. Yeah. But this is, this is a, 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 this current environment is one where you just, you cannot afford to be lazy in this arena 
during these times, right? So in, yeah, in, in summary, like the way that I think of this point here, Benji, is like in this current situation, there's two kinds of companies. There's the ones, there are the ones that are going to be able to pass on these mm-hmm. rising costs to their customers effectively. And thus, by the way, driving revenue up, which mm-hmm. is great. And then there's those that are going to get really margin squeezed. Margin right? squeezed. That's a yeah. good way to think those, about it. There, there, there's two companies in there and you want to be in the camp of the former, right? Um, and there, there's there's a couple of things that, that you got to, that, that need to be in place really for that to be able to happen. Like one, you need to be administratively strong and very mm-hmm. diligent on some of this. Up to date. Up to date. With Not the, six months behind on your numbers. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and your agreements, your, your estimates need to reflect that. And two... Um, this is not a quick fix, but your brand's got to be strong enough to be able to withstand price increases in a market where everything is is increasing in price. But you want to be in the camp of the companies of, that are passing these rising costs through to their customers, not in the latter, which is which are the companies that cannot do that, whether it's because of brand or they're just not administratively on top of things and they're going to get extraordinarily margin squeezed. Um, I hear a lot of, like when I bring up this point at a conference or like I've, at a, like I've, you know, I'm speaking with slides or I'm doing a webinar. Like I often hear pushback question goes, why well, I, I, I can't sell that to the customer. If that's you right now, I would really challenge. That is a total belief system in your mind. You made that up. You 100%. have made that How up. much is that customer you have paying made for that a gallon or a liter of gasoline? They're paying How much are they paying for They're an paying avocado? for the house. They're yeah. paying more for everything. Yeah. It would actually be weird for you, the electrical contractor, to just like honor your old pricing. So if like just i would really really challenge those those of you that have that belief system floating around your 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 mind your customer is more than likely expecting it at this point so get like like igor said be in the camp that's able to pass these rate these uh price increases along to the customer with some efficiency yeah. okay get, let's move on benji one what? more thing do not get emotional about it that's, no yeah pe- people get wrapped up in that like they so, get upset yeah, it's just it, it, it's just very simple. This is a reality. Inflation's a thing. It has always been a thing, by the way. Prices rise over time. Uh, even if we were talking oh, a year like, ago. Back yeah. in my day, these things cost this yeah, much. Yeah, totally. Yeah, right. Yeah. The reality is everything's Whatever. more expensive every year. And if even like even outside of this current circumstance, if you're not raising prices, standardized pricing every year, you're you're missing the boat. So let's move on to number three. Okay, number three. This is a fun one. All right. Number three, everyone, is shiny objects. Okay. And you know the stuff I'm talking about. About. Uh, it's a new F 150 for the growing fleet. It's a new trailer so that your PM can haul more shit around. Uh, if you're a painter, you might get suckered into splurging on the new line of Graco sprayers. Um, with or, Bluetooth now. With, yeah, with, <laughs> with Bluetooth and VR goggles. Um, maybe there's like a boom lift that looks pretty sexy that would make those larger commercial jobs that much easier. If you're a landscaper, forget it. Bobcats, skid steers, other heavy equipment, the menu of expensive toys that you lot look at and can rationalize as an essential business expense is, to be honest, is kind of unfair. The cards are definitely stacked against you guys. Anyway, I don't have time to like list off all of the seductive purchases that fit into this group, but I think you catch my drift. These are generally... Uh, they're large, expensive, one-off purchases that are made partly for the sake of your business, but also just partly because you want it. Now, don't get us wrong here. Like, we are not saying that your team doesn't deserve nice things. I think it's important that you invest in your equipment. It's important that you invest in infrastructure. It's important that you have the tools for the job. Um, and so I'm not at all saying buy discount ladders and always get used equipment and, and, and like nickel and dime for every single thing that your, your team uses. There's definitely a case to be made for having good stuff. But uh, we are saying that there is a difference between strategically planned and budgeted for capital investment versus more of a nice to have item that's an impulse buy and you make it partway through this season and you're able to justify it because I guess it does technically help the business. It's like, yeah, yeah that boom lift is going to make my jobs that much more. It's going to, it's going to help my guys are going to like it. We can get up and down more quickly. It's like, yes, you can make mm-hmm. the case that it helps, but I don't think it's a particularly strong case. And if we're honest with ourselves, these are usually like splurge items, the yeah. toys. So th- th- this is where when we talk about profit killers, that's the fundamental difference is that piece you just mentioned. It's absolute. this is not like a game of getting use safety harnesses this is like the, we're talking about the difference of uh of of smart entrepreneurs that calculate how they're going to deploy 
their investment capital and what they're going to invest into versus people that buy something because oh, that's probably a good idea. Right. Right. One That's is in, the difference. One is intentional and calculated. The other is reactive and kind of emotional. Um, we've like I've done this. You've we've all kind of made this mistake at some point, only to six months later really have it bite you in the ass. Every year within BTA, um, there's a handful of these purchases, and then there's usually some upset at fiscal year end. Um, now, one thing I actually I've heard a lot, Igor, and I'd love to kind of get your accountant's brain on this. Um. What about like buying assets near you? I'm sure someone listening to this is, is going, okay, what about this? Near year end, you've made a bunch of money. You've had a good season. You go out and buy a bunch of stuff to bring your net profit lower so that you fit into a lower tax bracket. What's, what are your thoughts on that kind of thinking? <laughs> yeah, that one that one's just a myth. Uh, you're kind of just telling yourself a story to convince yourself you could buy some more nice stuff, right? The reality is um, governments and tax codes have completely eliminated the ability to do this, right? So there's a difference between current expenses and capital expenses. There's like small things are like the paint that you buy for the job right. site or the wood. Those are current expenses and you can literally expense them at the end of the year. And yes, they deduct off of your revenue because you're just billing the customer for them. But capital expenses, which, uh, you know, Canada and the U.S. somewhat differ on this. In Canada, it's called, a, you know, capital cost allowance classes. They're very clearly defined. And there's a ton of these classes with very, very explicit definitions. And yeah. something as simple as a nice iPad or a computer, you cannot even just expense that at, at, at a year. It gets depreciated over time uh, based on a very clearly defined schedule mm -hmm. within the CCA or capital cost allowance class. So um, yeah, you, you don't just go out and buy like a you know, diesel F450 platinum and an expense at the end of a year. It doesn't that, work like that. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. So somebody that goes, man, I'm really strategic. I bought this truck right at the end of this season. I saved a whole bunch on taxes. They're, they're kidding themselves. You're kidding yourself. You're just buying a truck. Okay. So what are the, if somebody like, do, are there, you know, part of this is just discipline, right? Like it's just saying no to things, which is hard, especially for entrepreneurs who are, you know, suffer from shiny object syndrome. It's like an ongoing joke. What, what practical steps can be taken to, um, combat the urge to not make some of these impulse buys. We still want to invest in our business, but we got to watch these splashy purchases that really, really kill the profit at the end of the year. What can be done about this? So here's the fundamental point, right? You got to understand that every dollar has earning potential and therefore there's opportunity cost by spending it. Okay. And, and this is, this is where I think as, as a business owner and as a business leader, you have to put your investor hat on as well, because mm -hmm. in addition to being a business manager, like you manage your contracting business, you're also an investor by the fact that you're an owner in it. So you're, you've, you're two different things. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and, and as an investor, what you think about is like, where am I deploying each of my dollars so that they can get to work? Because if you don't deploy it in the company, you can probably deploy it elsewhere at whatever 10 to 15% returns over time, right? So you got to really think about buying equipment that way. And, and to be clear, Benji, I want to reiterate your, your point before, which is like investing into productive equipment is absolutely fundamental. It's awesome. It needs to be done regularly, but there's got to be a tangible and very clearly defined ROI on this expenditure, mm -hmm. right? And that's that difference when we talk about profit killers is people that think about it that way, as opposed to people that think about it like, oh man, like I think my guys would be a lot happier if they had a nice, some nice new right. trucks with leather seats, right? right. That, that's like completely different way of, of looking at things, right? So we just want to paint a bit of a practical example, right? So if you're, um, if you're looking at, uh, let's say, uh, a sales guy's coming at you with some new booms, right? right. You run a, a painting company or roofing company or whatever. Um, and you're, you're looking at, well, you know, would it make sense? It'd be really nice if we had some, you know, a couple S60 booms mm -hmm. just around the warehouse. We could be so much easier for the mm -hmm. guys. We could just get them to site. But think about it from this perspective. Like, does it make sense to purchase that new boom for, let's say, $85,000, by the way, plus the delivery vehicle, you got to get them around. Plus you need to pay the labor in house to move this thing around. Plus you have to pay to store it. Plus you have to insure it. Right. right? Plus you have, uh, there's all this stuff, right? Plus, plus, plus. Or what about the, you know, just you right now you're renting them at whatever, 1300 bucks a week. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't buy the booms or buy six booms, maybe in your specific 
uh, business that might make sense. But the point is there's got to be some really basic math. And I'm talking like your phone calculator in the back of a napkin should be able to do this, where you can put the numbers together to justify why that purchase with the insurance, with the storage, all that stuff, why that's going to bring an ROI on your money as compared to renting Mm -hmm. based on the types of jobs you're doing, how many of them you're doing, your rate of growth, all of that kind of stuff. You're kind of looking at, you're looking at this from like a, like a finance 101 net present value. You're an investor. Yeah. Yeah. You were looking at this from like a very, very investment lens. Exactly. And 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 that's the way, so I'm using the the example of a boom, something, something even a simple dude as a website, right? We're going, we've done a number of website reiterations, by the way, speaking of capital cost lines, even in Canada, you can't just expense the cost of developing a website because really? what no because what the government is saying well that website you can't just expense it in this year because that website is going to bring value delivers for, value for the next whatever six seven years i don't have the book in front of me but there's there's it's in that schedule the capital cost alignment schedule you depreciate that website you can actually get into some pretty serious trouble here if you don't understand these 100 percent because you're paying all, all of the of money Cash for that website gone. but you've not actually yeah, expensed it so right. you're actually way worse off right so the point is 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 there's stuff that that delivers roi over time i'm using the example of a boom but it's something as basic as a website if you're gonna you're like oh man my website's kind of shitty and i don't love the way it looks and whatever um the thing you got to ask yourself is okay well if we're going to spend fifty five thousand bucks on a new website Okay, maybe it's not quite that much if you're building a basic site. That's a nice website. Yeah, but whatever you're paying, you have to say, like, how is this thing going to pay me back and then some? Yeah. Right? How many more leads than the current website is this thing going to bring in? And be real with yourself. And be real with yourself, right? So, yeah, it doesn't, what we're saying is not like, hey, you must rent booms or whatever forever investing in your business is extremely important just know the difference between analyzing an investment property uh just like you would a piece of real estate that you that you're getting asked to to buy into uh as opposed to getting you know ex, uh, excited guessing mm-hmm. and uh and, and kidding yourself so i think the real practical takeaway guys here is just don't it's not just buying stuff do not buy stuff without doing an actual roi analysis be real with yourself. How much is this like shiny thing really going to net you on that investment? So I think that's some, that's probably uh, a good place to start to bring this to a close. I want to just summarize. We're talking about overhead efficiency, watching how productive those like fixed cost salaries, those types of roles are through The way you hire them, the way you manage them, the way you set goals of them, extremely important to quantify that and not just create this bulging business with lots of people doing a whole bunch of different things, but lower productivity. Number two, materials, okay? Huge, huge profit killer. Get be in, the, be in the business category, as Igor says, that is good at passing rising costs off to the customer. Number three is watch those shiny object expenses. Watch those purchases. Don't make those splashy buys just because you feel like it. Final note, okay? If you want help understanding your numbers you want to increase your business's profitability. Um, you want to examine your PL with the expert eye of a coach. If you'd like to enjoy a much higher net profit, if you'd like your overhead efficiency to go up. If a lot of the stuff today made sense to you, uh, again, really, really encourage you to check out Breakthrough Academy to get on a call with us. You can use the link in the description. You click that link. You fill it a very simple form and we will be in touch. We'd love to connect with you. That's it. Thanks for listening. Keep your eye on those three profit killers. Have a great day. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.